protection to domestic workers. Before I speak any further, let me uh, you know, capitalize on something that uh, Council Member Brad said. <laughs> si se puede. <laughs> claro que si, podemos. Especialmente cuando nosotros trabajamos juntos, luchamos para justicia, para los que trabajan duro para la ciudad de Nueva York. And como el presidente de este comité, estoy muy feliz de estar aquí en el momento precioso para todos ustedes. Felicidades. <laughs> Now, <laughs> uh, it is uh, estimated that uh, nationally, nationally, there are about 2.5 million domestic workers and the industry is considered one of the nation's fastest growing professions. With an aging population and more women joining the workforce, the Bureau of Labor Statistics expect the number of home health care and personal care aid to increase by 47% or 39% respectively, and for the number of child care workers to increase by 7%. Despite the growing demand, domestic workers often face poor working conditions and are vulnerable, vulnerable to abuse, including sexual harassment, assault, and various other forms of discrimination. The nature of domestic workers often perpetuates the vulnerability of workers, as it is often intermittent, isolated, or performed for every small employees, such as an individual or family. Domestic work is highly gendered. 95% of domestic workers are women, and 54% identify as non-white. In a recent survey of domestic workers, over 80% reported working, worked in abuse situation. Despite the rampant violation, there is limited resource in law for domestic workers. For example, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination against workers except employers with fewer than 15 workers. In 2010, the New York State Human Rights Law was amended to protect domestic workers from sexual and discriminatory harassment. However, domestic workers remained excluded from the definition of employee under the state human rights law, therefore limiting the extent of human rights protection. Similarly, New York City human rights law only applies to employees, employers with four or more employees. As such domestic workers who are often employed in private home by those who have fewer employees miss out on many of the city's human rights protection. Last year, the city council passed local law 98 of 2018, which removed the four employees requirement for only gender-based harassment claim. Entro 339A would amend the New York City human rights law to extend all of its employment protection to domestic workers. We look forward to hearing testimony today from the administration, advocacy group, and other interested stakeholders. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the members uh, of the committee who have just joined us. We have with us uh, Council Member John, Council Member Wardlander, and our, of course, the sponsor of this wonderful bill, Council Member Debbie Rose. And I would like also to thank the committee staff, Belki Mireng, and uh, uh, who is the senior counsel to the committee. Leah Squidpeck, policy analyst, and Nevin Singh, 
finance analyst, as well as my staff, David Suarez and Jean Fugan. And I would like also to thank and Mr. Josh Kensley, who is covering also for Belki. Now I would like to call my colleagues and the sponsor of this bill, Councilmember Debbie Rose, uh, for uh, remarks. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you so much, Chair Eugene. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for your support of this critical piece of legislation and for allowing me to speak briefly about Intro 339, the Domestic Workers Discrimination Bill. Intro 339 will give domestic workers the rights that they so desperately need to fight against workplace discrimination. We tried to get this bill passed during my first two terms. So I am especially grateful and eager to have this hearing today. Intro 339 will include domestic workers in the New York City Human Rights Law, which provides essential employee protections from discrimination based on race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and all other intrinsic parts of their identities. Currently, this prohibition only applies to employers with four or more employees. This legislation expands protections to include employers of domestic workers, even if only one employee is a domestic worker. Anti-discrimination and harassment laws have many times left out domestic workers because of the non-traditional nature of their work. But these same workers are often the ones who need these very protections the most. They face extraordinary obstacles, obtaining employment and negotiating fair wages. Employers can fire them without notice for discriminatory reasons, such as being pregnant. One third of domestic workers report facing verbal abuse from their employer, and many say that a factor of their abuse has had to do with their immigration status, their race or ethnicity, age, religion, or sexual orientation. Yet these workers still cannot file discrimination complaints. I am reintroducing this bill in an effort to send a clear message to all that discrimination in New York City will not be tolerated. Additionally, it will give New Yorkers the opportunity to seek recourse if they have been discriminated against in the workplace. Domestic workers deserve the same civil right protections as every other worker. And I'm gonna do this for you. <laughs> I look forward to hearing the testimony on this bill. I want to thank Chair Eugene again for hearing this. Um, legislation. I wish to thank my staff as well as the Progressive Caucus who helped us get the super majority and the Black and Latino Asian Caucus for their continued support on this legislation. I also want to acknowledge the tireless advocates from the Domestic Workers Alliance for their dedication to helping domestic workers overcome the severe employment hardships that they have to bear daily. So, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rose. But before we hear from the administration, I would like to call Mr. Josh uh, Kensley to administer the oath. Good morning. Please Good raise morning. your right hand. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to answer honestly to Councilmember questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, please state your name for the record and go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Chair Eugene and members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights and sponsor Council Member Rose. Um, I am Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing on intro 339A, which would extend ex employment protections under the city human rights law to domestic workers, regardless of their employer's size. The bill would eliminate the four employee minimum for employer liability with respect to domestic workers, meaning that a domestic worker, often working as the sole employee of an employer, would have explicit protection under the city human rights law from discrimination and harassment in hiring, 
firing and the terms and conditions of employment with respect to reasonable accommodations and with respect to retaliation. The Commission recognizes the unique vulnerabilities that domestic workers face and several members of the agency's staff, including Car uh, Commissioner Malalas and myself, have represented domestic workers in wage theft cases and trafficking cases prior to joining this agency. Domestic workers are disproportionately women, people of color, and immigrants. Domestic workers have historically been excluded from labor law and anti-discrimination protections, and because of this exclusion, have often faced, have often been forced to work in unregulated, unsafe, and exploitative situations. Recognizing the barriers domestic workers have unjustly faced, the administration and the commission have worked to build relationships with domestic worker organizers and advocates, including many of the people here today, through the Paid Care Working Group of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, and working with organizations like National Domestic Workers Alliance and their member organizations on outreach, education, and other partnerships and collaborations. In December 2017, at the Commission's public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace, organizer Daniela Contreras provided courageous and compelling testimony about her experience facing sexual harassment as a young nanny in her employer's home, highlighting the fact that in most circumstances, domestic workers have had no legal protections under the city human rights law. After that testimony, the Commission worked with City Council and the Administration to implement new protections against gender-based harassment, including eliminating the four-employee minimum for such claims, which means that now all workers, regardless of the size of their employer, are protected from gender-based harassment. Since the package of that passage of that bill in 2018, the Commission has continued to work closely with domestic worker advocates to ensure they know about this new protection and know how to access us at the Commission. Earlier this year, the Commission launched its first of its kind online sexual harassment prevention training and drawing on input from domestic worker advocates included a scenario involving sexual harassment of a domestic worker, taking the opportunity to educate New York City employees who may also be employers of domestic workers regarding their obligations under the city human rights law. If this bill passes, the Commission is committed to working with domestic workers, advocates, our sister agencies, and domestic worker employer networks to ensure New Yorkers know what their rights and obligations are under this provision. Domestic workers, as we know, do the work that allows many of us to do our work. And for that, we owe them the protections the city human rights law affords most other workers in New York City. Thank you for convening today's hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Deputy Commissioner. So you can start. Good morning, Chair Eugene and members Good of the morning. Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I'm Stephen Atanani, Executive Director for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCWP Commissioner Lorelei Salas in support of the expansion of the city human rights law to cover domestic workers. The city council, through Local Law 98 of 2016, created the Paid Care Division. It is housed within DCWP's Office of Labor Policy and Standards, led by a division head and the paid care advocate. The division is charged with coordinating with stakeholders and workers to protect and raise job standards in the paid care industry, including for domestic workers, home care workers, house cleaners, and others. Primarily women of color and immigrants, paid care workers play an essential role in New York City's economy, caring for our loved ones. However, these workers face inherent challenges in exercising their rights in the workplace. They frequently work out of public view, alone in private homes, isolated from their peers. To address these challenges, DCWP works strategically and collaboratively with trusted partners to reach workers and ensure they know and have the tools to realize their protections. Many of those partners are here today with us in the committee room today. Over the past six months alone, our staff has interacted with over 2,000 paid care workers at more than 50 events. We've met paid care workers at playgrounds, at events hosted by community and faith-based partners, and even at industry trainings that were mandated by DCWP's consent orders with agencies employing home health aides, and that required those agencies provide their workers resources about legal protections. Most recently, DCWP 
and the National Domestic Workers Alliance co-hosted an open house for paid care workers to provide them with an overview of their rights and resources and gathered a working group of stakeholders, including our colleagues at CCHR, to further strategize on engagement and policy advocacy going forward. DCWP's collaboration with partners, including the Paid Care Working Group, helped inform model standards for the paid care industry that were published in DCWP's 2018 report, Lifting Up Paid Care Work. The standards were, int were intentionally aspirational, but just two years later, one of them, protection from discrimination and harassment, could be realized by the intent of the legislation before us today. In this context, expanding the city's human rights law to include domestic workers would mark another important milestone in the movement to raise standards in the industry. At DCWP, we are committed to supporting the power of domestic workers and the momentum they have created for a cultural shift that recognizes their vital importance to the daily functioning of the city and its economy. For this reason, we have sought to expand our own protections for paid care workers through Introduction 800, which would allow all domestic workers accrue their paid safe and sick leave and paid personal time based on the number of hours they work and begin using their time 90 days after starting work with an employer, giving them parity with other workers in the city. DCWP looks forward to our continued collaboration with partners and the council as we work to make these protections a reality for domestic workers and help ensure that paid care workers know their rights and how to enforce them. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Ethan Nani. Thank you. And uh, let me take the opportunity to thank uh, the Deputy Commissioner, uh, uh, Dana Sussman, and also Mr. Ethan Nani, both of you and also your institution for what you're doing for domestic workers. I think that New York City is home to so many people, and we say that all the time. People coming from all over the world, regardless of the language they speak, the religion, the faith, the, all of us, we come for the same reason, to have a piece of the American dream. And those people, they are hardworking people, trying to make a living, to have a better life for themselves and their family members. They work hard. And they also, they are part of the backbone of the economy of the city. And I think they deserve justice and protection. And I commend all of you and for what you have been doing to help those people. And many, many of them, you know, they have many other barriers and challenges, like language barriers, cultural barriers. They come to a country, they got to fight to survive. I think uh, we have the moral mandate as city, as elected official, my colleagues over here, and I commend them also for the, the leadership and advocacy on behalf of all the workers. Councilmember Bradley and John and Rose, thank you so much for what you have been doing for all the workers. And I thank you again, and I think that uh, we, we will continue, and we have to continue to work together. As they say that, si se puede, and this is uh, true when we work together, and we are going to continue to work together to protect the domestic workers and all those hardworking people who are part of the fabric of New York City. With this, Deputy Commissioner, could you tell us how many inquiries does the, the commission hear from domestic workers each year? How many people each year? That so I do not have that figure in front of me. Um, oftentimes we get we get close to 10,000 or a little bit over 10,000 inquiries a year through our hotline, our email, um, and, and other means, um, walk-ins to our offices, et cetera. Um, we have not um, been, when many of them are not jurisdictional, in other words, if we don't currently have protections for those workers, we will refer them often to other resources. Um, I know that our numbers are not high. They are, they are quite low. And we have worked with many of the advocates in the room um, to share the information that, they, that people do have protections under the city human rights law with respect to gender-based or sexual harassment currently under the city human rights law for domestic workers. We also, and have been doing this for several years, um, we will count 
employees, even if that, um, for, with respect to reaching that four employee minimum, if um, an employer of a domestic worker has another business, for example, or employs other people, um, we will look to all of those other businesses or um, uh, employment situations to count to get to that four employee minimum. So we have been working um, very transparently with the domestic worker advocacy community to convey that we are interpreting the law very broadly and you know, when in doubt, come to us, we will look at the case um, on a case-by-case -case basis and assess whether, we, whether or not we have jurisdiction. But I think one of the challenges we face today, along with you know, our colleagues in the administration, is ensuring that people know what their rights are, that our, our process is clear and transparent and people feel like they have um, a resource in us. Um, and so that's something that we will continue to work on to ensure that cases are coming to us. You already, you already answered three of my questions. <laughs> so I don't know if I have to ask them anymore. So, but anyway, uh, I, I think that uh, when we are trying to provide services, we have also to make sure that we get an idea of the constituency, the number of people, of course, who come us, to us, but what is if we, we should be able to break down and gender and probably ethnicity and the different type of categories this is in order for us to be in, in, be in a better position to provide the services that we are providing because we know that people who don't speak english properly will face other challenges because of they don't speak english people who come from certain countries or certain ethnicity will face other realities. So it is very important that we gather the information in order for us to, to, uh, to be more effective in helping those people. And I you know, strongly recommend that the commission to you know, take consideration and to take step to make sure that we have all the data. And that will help us also, we council members, to uh, do a better job and to help those people. And the other question that I want to ask you is, uh, uh, you say that in your testimony that uh, you work together with other advocate, advocacy group. Can you elaborate on your relationship you know, with those advocacy group, what you do, and what is uh, uh, exactly they are able to provide to you, and do you provide also any type of assistance to those advocacy group? to ensure that uh, you know, the work you are doing together can be more effective. Yes, sure. Um, so our agency under, um, under Commissioner Malalas has taken um, a real, um, pr has, has placed a real priority on engagement and outreach. Um, and it's reflected too in our work with domestic worker advocates. Even before um, the paid care division at DCA was launched, I think back in 2015 in the first, or 2016, the first year, within the first year of Commissioner Mal Malalas' tenure, we convened along with our partners at DCA, Moya and International Affairs, um, round tables with domestic worker advocates, um, many again of the folks in this room today, around what the city could do um, to serve this community. And many of the ideas that were sort of uh, fomented in those convenings resulted, I think, in some of the work that that um, we're all doing now, including protections for domestic workers um, on paid sick leave, um, the paid care division, um, the, the gender-based harassment protections, um, and, and some other initiatives that I think are forthcoming. So we have been working, we have had these conversations, I think they were scheduled quarterly back when we started, um, and since the launch of the paid care division, um, we, CCHR and DCA and Moya and others have, have had regular convenings um, with domestic worker advocates, and I know I will leave that for uh, my colleague here to, to comment further on. In addition, we have a direct line of communication to many of the organizations here. So if there is a potential case, a potential concern, um, people know exactly how to reach me or how to reach some of my colleagues in the Law Enforcement Bureau, and we always um, we are always an open ear and an open line um, to get questions answered. We have pre presented at trainings. Um, we have presented at convenings. Um, and we will, whenever any of the groups here want us to be somewhere, we will be there. Um, so uh, even beyond sort of the more formalized 
convenings that we, or, or um, meetings that we have, we also just have a direct line of communication to, to many of the folks in this room. And if we don't, I will say that we welcome it <laughs> to everyone here um, to make sure that we are, again, a friendly face, a familiar voice um, for, for the communities here. Oh, go ahead, yeah, I just wanted to, to piggyback on, on what Dana was just speaking about. I think, you know, this work by its nature is interdisciplinary. And that means that, you know, it's relying on resources not only within my own agency at DCWP uh, related to outreach and intake and, and legal work, but also with our colleagues in city government, um, of which CCHR is a, is a primary partner. Um, and I am truly heartened to see uh, the folks in this room, um, our, our worker orgs that are uh, so crucial to our work. Um, ADICAR, NDWA, Make the Road, for example, I think all of which are here today. Um, they are critical um, to ensure that we're meeting domestic workers, paid care workers, um, where they are. Um, that includes at playgrounds. <coughs> That includes at uh, trainings and workshops. Um, and as I mentioned in my testimony, our, our latest open house um, included tips for interviews, um, how to conduct those, or how to um, you know, advocate for yourself when you're um, asking for a raise potentially. What, you know, just basic information, including what is the minimum wage right now for, for uh, paid care workers. Um, these are environments and these are seminars that are empowering um, and we can't wait to continue to work um, with these groups in the future. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some, you know, the importance of, uh, you mentioned resources. It seemed that you said that you know, uh, your work is based on resources. But my question to you, do you have, both of you, the Customer Affair and also the Commission, do you have enough resources to handle this uh, very important task? Because we know that as we say that, uh, the people you are serving and we are serving, you know, they, are, they came from different uh, background, different you know, ethnicity, and also they are facing so many challenges that may put them in the position to be discriminated. Do you have enough resources to handle this situation? Um, so I think that- And also, oh. let me add something to the question. Could you tell us what are the most important, the most uh, uh, difficult challenges that you are facing, you know, in delivering the services to the hardworking people? To effectively implement this, this provision, it will require um, that the commission and, and our partners in the administration work collaboratively and work creatively um, to ensure that we reach employers um, and that we reach domestic workers. Um, historically, I will say in the re recently in, in the history of the commission, we have prioritized outreach to businesses, particularly small businesses that don't have um, you know, HR departments or lawyers advising them to ensure that they have the tools and the information they need to comply with the city human rights law. We, our audience for that has historically been businesses, not households. So we will need to reach households, again, where they're at. So whether that's parenting groups or, uh, you know, community boards, neighborhood associations, um, houses of worship, um, employers, large employers who have a workforce that may employ domestic workers. We really do need to think creatively about how we reach um, domestic worker employers so that they know how to comply with the law. Because I think what's really important is, unfortunately, the way that the legal system is set up is it puts the responsibility on the worker to do their advocacy or to file a case when the law is not complied with. We want to ensure that employers have are taking, you know, have the information to comply without needing a worker to have to bring a case to enforce one's rights. We, we want compliance. And so that is going to take, I think, again, a lot of collaborative work, a lot of creative work to reach households. Something that the commission has not, I will say to be very clear, has not historically focused on because our audience has typically been business. Um, but I think we're prepared to, to do that and we're open to working with everyone here in this room, including council members at their district offices or elsewhere, to get the word out, um, whether it's at 
libraries or community centers or anywhere else where we think we can meet um, neighborhoods and we can meet parents and um, or or people who are employing um, employing workers. Yeah, I, I think you know in terms of resources, where our paid care working group, which leverages just you know specifically our our uh, CCHR and Moya at the at the administration level. Um, as well as our worker groups and employer groups as well, that in of itself allows us to have an outsized impact um, in terms of outreach and strategic planning um, than um, strictly numbers, you know, and 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 resources uh, may may indicate at at a uh, at face value. Um, our our work and our partnership is always um, um, forward looking, and I think. In terms of in terms of uh, that and 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 an outreach and meeting folks where they are, um, w you know we have the we have the 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 will to uh, to make sure that 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 uh, we're effectively getting the messaging out. You give a very good answer, but I don't think that you touch exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> and I think my colleagues we asked this type of question several times previously. But I'm talking about the financial resources. Do you have enough budget, enough you know, financial resources to do the job? I know that you got partners, you got uh, volunteer people of good heart who uh, spend time you know, helping you, helping the hardworking people. But let's put it this way. I think this is a very uh, uh, great and extended uh, job. The tax is big. So do you have the resources to do it? In addition to the collaboration from the advocacy group and uh, partners and volunteers, do you have the resources to do it? Um, I know. And what can we do from the city council to help you be in the better position to help those hardworking people? Um. <laughs> Thank you for that question, and I know Councilmember Eugene. You, uh, it, you know, this is not the first time I've we've had this exchange. We know. Um, I yes. know that. <laughs> we know that. Um, so I will. Um, and I don't, we don't want to put you in the hot seat, but we want to make sure that we work together to serve the people we are beginning to serve. I, I, I suppose I will answer it in a similar way I've answered it before, <laughs> which is the city human rights law has been amended, um, I believe, 28 times under um, Commissioner Malalas' tenure, so that's four and a half years. So we're averaging about six or more amendments a year. Some, uh, I, that is my best estimate, I confess, today. Um, and so every amendment requires um, implementation. Not every amendment is a broadening, necessarily, the city human rights law explicitly or an added protection. Um, many of them are. And that um, we have been able to um, take in that, uh, that broadened mandate, that extended mandate, and, um, and, in, and build it into our work. It is challenging, um, and we are, um, you know, an agency with a lot of work, and we could always do more. Um, with more resources, we can bring in more staff to enforce the law, to educate on the law. Um, but that is um, that is the s similar answer I've given before. But um, I know I know you understand um, the understand. conversation here. <laughs> yes. We do understand. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Before I call Councilmember Linda and Rose, let me ask you my last question before I get back to you. And we may uh, realize, and we all know that, you know, the people who are working as domestic workers, they speak several languages, and many of them speak Spanish over here. And I go back also to what my colleague says, si se puede. So the language is very, very important. So could you, could you tell us uh, what you have done to ensure that people who don't speak English uh, whose English is not the, the primary language, what step you have been taking to make sure you reach out to them, your outreach you know, uh, system, to make sure that they understand their right, to make sure that they get uh, uh, access to the resources and to the services that you are providing? Um, this is a constant challenge and something that we take incredibly seriously. Um, our agency, our staff speak over 30 languages at current count. Um, for an agency of our size that is a 
pretty remarkable um, number, although we recognize that we can continue to do better and to continue to prioritize that as far as a skill set for our workforce. Um, when someone um, doesn't speak uh, when we don't have a staff member available who speaks the language of, a, of an individual coming to us for help, we will always call immediately our, our language line contractor um, to provide a phone interpretation. And I've said this before, I recognize that's not ideal in many situations, but we will never turn someone away or not serve them or not communicate with them simply because we don't have someone available um, at the office that day or to speak with them. If we're doing community outreach, we will work very hard to make sure that the person representing the commission speaks the language of that community. Again, we don't always have everyone available all the time, but we really prioritize that um, to ensure that people can speak their own language in the language they're most comfortable in, hear information in their own language, um, connect with someone in government who speaks their language and may likely be from that community or from that neighborhood. Um, and so that is something, again, that we really prioritize. Our informational materials are tra translated in at least 10 languages. If anything on our website is not translated in those languages, it's likely because it is coming. Um, we often will start with English and Spanish first and then get the additional languages on the website. And I know there is a terrific um, informational material that we partnered with DCA on, um, a worker's bill of rights that I know is available in, in many, many more languages, and I'll, I'll let um, my colleague here um, talk about that. So it, we, we translate our materials. We have staff who speak over 30 languages. We present in those languages, um, and we will continue to improve our language access um, and continue to prioritize um, staff who, again, speak their language of communities across the city and have those connections to those communities. Yeah, I, you know, th thanks for the shout out for the, <laughs> some of the collateral that we have. I have some of them right here on hand, our Workers Bill of Rights, as well as um, a dedicated uh, pamphlet here for paid care workers that we utilize as well. These are in English here, but um, we, we have them in, in several different languages and all the executive order languages. Um, I will just make note, just most, uh, uh, we recently made a purchase of, of he uh, headset equipment um, that um, we will use increasingly in the field to provide um, live um, in-person interpretation. Um, and we utilize contracts uh, to ensure that we have the language capacities. Um, but just like um, the commission, we have um, incredible staff, uh, just in external affairs alone, we're talking about um, Spanish, Arabic, um, Bengali, uh, just to name a few um, native speakers of those languages. Um, but in the cases um, where we have staff that are not um, speaking the, or encounter individuals that um, there is a, a language barrier, we utilize language line, um, of course, um, and for planned events, these headsets um, are, are critical. Thank you very much. Uh, this is great. This is great. But Deputy Commissioner, you mentioned in your when you were answering the question that uh, if uh, there is nobody in your staff who speaks the language of the community or the person that you are helping, you look for somebody who speaks the language. But uh, what I could say, if you had more resources, more financial resources, you could have hired more people who speak more languages. There are so many languages in New York City, we won't be able to provide services in other languages. But more resources that you have, more people you can hire to, uh, to speak, you know, people who speak the languages of the other people that we are serving. But with this, uh, I want to call uh, Council Member Lender. And after that, Council Member Rose. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to defer to it's Council Member Rose's sorry, bill. Council Member Rose. Thank you. What a gentleman. <laughs> You're right, because this is the sponsor of the. I go by the other, but this is the, the, the sponsor of the legislation. Thank you. Council Member Wood. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to uh, sort of piggyback on, on uh, Chair Eugene's point. Um, it seems historically that. Uh, the Human Rights Commission is a little shy about asking for resources. I, I was, um, my first term, I was the chair of this committee, and, um, and that, that was also uh, sort of the stance that um, the commission took 
And um, I had hoped that we would, we would move beyond that so that you have here the chair of the finance committee sitting here and we're going to right. soon be engaging in you know negotiations for um, the next fiscal year. So I, I would hope that when, um, when we come before you with legislation that is really, really critical and important to um, the civil rights of our, our citizens that um, you not be shy about, you know, how we're going to enforce it. Um, and, um, and, and I, I just want you to do that. I, I had to, I really had to sort of elucidate on that because it seems to be an agency um, sort of mindset. And, um, and we want to make sure that um, while we're passing um, historic legislation, but we're also able to enforce it. And that's, um, and, and that's my first question, like, what are, are there obstacles to enforcement of uh, 339, intro 339? And if so, what, what are they? What do you anticipate? Sure, I think um, one challenge that I anticipate we will face is that many families likely do not see themselves as employers. And that is a real shift in framing this entire relationship. And while there are many other laws that protect, well, not many, there are other laws that protect or regulate, you know, um, payment, wages, um, paid sick leave and paid safe leave and other paid family leave now in the state of New York for domestic workers, there is a important mindset that we need to um, we need to change around being a domestic worker employer. Um, I had on my fridge for a very long time, my home is someone's workplace. I am a domestic worker employer. And my home is someone's workplace. And that, that is the message that we need to get out in the world. And I know there are organizations that are doing that work now. Um, and I think that we need to work to meet those families where, where they are. They are also employees, right? And we have access to business. So let's talk to large businesses about getting this information to their employees who are also employers of domestic workers or other ways that we can leverage some of the connections that we all have to have this conversation because this conversation is the core of it all, right? It's, it's recognizing that this may be a unique workplace. It may not look like the workplaces we are familiar with or how um, the human rights law had sort of imagined workplaces to be, but this is this is someone's workplace. Um, so that I think is our, gonna, gonna be one of our most fundamental challenges. And then educating employers on what they need to do to comply with the law. Um, because I think that there are aspects of our law that are more complicated than others and more uh, nuanced than others. And so really providing the materials, providing the resources um, to give to employers so that they understand what their obligations are and how to navigate how to navigate that. And then of course, outreach and education to workers as well. Um, it is an entire community of workers that we have, we have connections to many of the organizations here today, but it's building on that. Um, and thinking again about creative ways that we can get the word out. Um, probably publishing, well, I will imagine publishing new materials. Um, we have to frame the, the our, a lot of our materials are focused on, on business um, and workers in more traditional quote unquote traditional workplaces. So updating, changing materials, providing new materials, new programming, um, and and really having, really talking to um, to domestic worker employers about the fact that they are employers and subject to these to these um, to these regulations and to these laws. So um, that that is really um, a, a really important part of the success of whether or not domestic workers are afforded, you know, their civil rights. And, um, and so uh, I think DCPW, you, you said that you, you go out and you do a lot of work with the employees um, and you were saying that it's basically their responsibility to educate the employer. Um, 
but is there some process that we can um, engage in where at that initial point of, you know, when that agreement is made to employ someone that um, that, that employer, um, and oftentimes it's it's one on one. It's uh, it's a small. It's a a, a family. You know um, that's making that that connection. But there should be some part of the process where some sort of standardized or formalized um, exchange of information is happens at that point. Um, you know, the exchange of the employer, the employee's bill of rights, mm -hmm. the um, whatever other literature is available, just as that employer has expectations of the employee, the employee should be able to um, inform the employer, not like it's not my job, I'm mm -hmm. not doing it. <laughs> That's, that's not where I'm coming from, but just what, you know, the legal, what, what the law um, allows. Um, and the Human Rights Commission has an education unit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this kind of goes back to resources again, you know, um, that this unit should have something that the employees at the point of, you know, making, you know, the agreement to be hired can, you know, exchange with them. Is there something at this point that exists? Um, and is this something that the education um, part of human resources could actually focus on? Sure. Um, we don't currently have any materials that would, I think, be appropriate for this unique dynamic. But, I, but that is absolutely something that we will um, look into creating. And I think it, it, it likely makes sense to do it in partnership with, um, with DCA because there are many laws that protect domestic workers and that employers need to be aware of as well. So if there is a, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm sort of envisioning um, a joint document that we put together that would have rights and responsibilities, um, and it's either something that the employee can hold on to or the employer can give um, an exchange so it's a notice to everyone about what their rights are. Um, but I think that that is fundamentally key to this, to implementation, um, not only so people can have it in their workplace, but that we can use it as part of our outreach. Um, we can host events and circulate that, that document. Um, so I think that that is going to be certainly a priority of ours to make sure we, we can publish something that's clear and that um, really presents kind of a one, a one resource document um, for people who are hiring and for people who are working in, the, in, work, in homes. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, certainly DCWP does not believe that the entire burden um, of, of making sure that um, laws and regulations are, are abided by falls on an employee, certainly not a, you know, the, those in the paid care industry, certainly not domestic workers. Um, <clears throat> so I think, as, as my colleague mentioned, depending on the, mat I, there w there most likely will be new materials created and and part of this paid care working group, which includes employer organizations, for example, um, there will be a, a, a novel thinking about how best to communicate um, to families, to individuals who may not think of themselves traditionally as an employer, how do we um, make that top of mind for them? How do we um, engage with them? And I think you know we're we're actively um, going to be crossing those bridges when we get there. Have we um, been able to uh, figure out how to address um, sort of preferences in terms of? Um, hiring of domestic workers in terms of um, maybe gender. Uh, you have an elderly female who has a preference. Um, have we been able to um, figure out how we're going to work with, you know, the personal preferences in terms of and ensuring that it's just not discriminatory? 
The city human rights law has, as we know, many categories of protection, of which gender is one, and we all can understand why gender-based discrimination is um, illegal and has been for a very long time. These, this situation is, involves people's homes, people's private lives, there's, there's an intimacy to the relationship, and we recognize that. Um, as the um, statute, or as the, the bill is currently drafted, um, gender-based discrimination in hiring based on someone's personal preference um, would be treated like any other form of discrimination based on gender. Um, and so I think we need to think about, and we are very open to thinking this through with everyone in the room and, and the council on how we address some of those concerns that are unique to this dynamic involving someone's home and someone's private life um, and, um, and, and think about ways that we can you know, bridge the divide between sort of the statutory text and the real life experiences and needs of people who are uh, bringing someone into their home to care for their loved ones. So there's gonna be an ongoing um, dialogue about how we sort of bridge, you know. This. Yes, oh. yes. Um, is there um, any um, current protections that's offered to the domestic workers through the state's human rights laws um, and uh, and how how do they differ from 339, intro 339? Are are there differences and um, you know? So there are um, a lot of changes going on at the state levels. Um, in, in some ways, um, there are it's it's kind of this new um, we're in a new time where the state is moving forward on a lot of um, new and progressive changes. Um, there are um, in some ways, it appears that the state human rights law has incorporated more protections currently than the city human rights law has for domestic workers. Our, this bill at the city level would include um, protections for domestic workers under all areas of employment-based protections, which includes, as we've described, gender, age, disability, religion, um, and many others. Um, and it would also provide protections against um, discrimination in hiring and firing. So not just, so in harassment, all the protections, in hiring and firing, all of the protections. And in addition, uh, reasonable accommodations in the context of the four areas where the city human rights law allows for reasonable accommodations. And that's for pregnancy, disability, religious observance, and status as a victim of domestic violence, sexual violence, or stalking. Um, and that um, is, I think, an area that, um, you know, it, it, again, is another another point where we will continue to have that conversation, and I think is incredibly important in this um, for this bill. Um, but this bill would look at domestic workers no differently than, as written, as any other employment relationship um, under the city human rights law. Great. So it's a part of the most comprehensive uh, human rights law that exists, right? That is one of the most. I, Very good. Yes. One of the most. <laughs> I heard it was the most. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rose. Uh, Councilmember Bartlander, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Rose. Congratulations on this great bill. And to all the extraordinary organizers and allies in the room, just big props on this, the, the work to build this powerful movement uh, of organizing domestic workers. So I just uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance and Adikar and We Dream in Black and Make the Road and Carol Gardens Association and everybody who's carrying the organizing work. Thank you, like it's powerful to see you here today and to allies from Hand in Hand and the Progressive Caucus and Legal Aid and, and Take Root Justice. It, uh, this is important and, and we're grateful to be here together. So thank you all. Um, I'll just add my voice to, uh, you know, we know we need to get you more resources. Like you guys work for the mayor, that's how this, is work, uh, how this works. You can't sit up there and say we need more money, but you need more money. Um, uh, and, and that's because we've dramatically expanded the law and the work that you guys have to do, and you've leaned into doing things that are not mandated by law um, in terms of lots of good outreach and uh, community engagement, and we don't want you to have to end those things, but um, as we've talked about in the past, for the good reason that more people have rights and are availing themselves of their rights, you know, it's important to add the data here, like wait times on complaint processing and resolutions have gone up, 
because you can't process a lot more complaints with the same number of people. So that's on us, uh, you know, and, and I think the chair and Councilmember Rose and Finance Chair Drum and I have all uh, been pushing on this and we'll have to do it again this budget cycle to get you the, the resources. Um, um, I just, we'll hear from domestic workers in a, in a few minutes, but I, I just, I'm curious what are some of the kinds of complaints you think you're going to get when this law is passed, if those playground conversations are any indication or if you just know from what you've received already. Can you give us a couple examples of the kinds of discrimination complaints that are likely to come and the kinds of resolution that the commission has been able to achieve on those kinds of other issues for similar workers? Um, I will also defer much of the expertise to the, the, next, uh, the next panels um, that will include domestic worker organizers and advocates. Um, but I do know that um, while gender-based harassment has already been incorporated as a protection, I think that is going to be or continues to be an issue that many folks face in isolated workplaces. Um, again, where you're behind closed doors, it's already sort of this intimacy of the, of the um, of the space, um, I think there will, what I've been hearing again, and I, I don't mean to, um, to take any space up from, the, from our subsequent panels, but I think there will likely be some age cases, um, whether it's um, because of concerns about someone's possibility of becoming pregnant, um, or age um, as someone gets older and their ability, or uh, preconceived notions about one's ability to, to, to do the job. Um, and I think there um, might be uh, pregnancy accommodation issues, disability accommodation issues, um, religion um, as a, uh, rather than religious observance as an accommodation necessarily, but um, religious discrimination or race discrimination as well. Um, but I, I will defer, and I hope I did not misrepresent anything um, from, from the folks here. I think immigration status in this environment, I should add, um, using that as a tool to exploit, to threaten to create fear, um, again, threatening um, federal immigration enforcement or things like that is likely something that, that we will see. And I hope people know that we issued legal enforcement guidance very recently, um, making it very clear that to use, sort of to weaponize ICE or even the police to, um, to sow fear or to exploit a, a worker under our law is discrimination on the basis of immigration status or national origin. Um, and that certainly, as if we were to incorporate these protections, that would apply as well. Um, on how these cases might resolve, um, one of the initiatives that our commissioner has really prioritized is um, looking at restorative justice measures. And I think that um, especially for families that might not know what their obligations are under the law or might not have, um, might, might not yet have the tools to engage in a dialogue about what an accommodation is, a, when an accommodation is appropriate or what accommodation might be available. We are really looking to not, um, you know, heavily penalize or fine families, households necessarily, but really educate, train, engage in restorative justice to the extent that both parties are willing to um, and to create a path forward. I think that there will likely be uh, back pay available if someone is not hired or terminated um, because of a, a protection or um, if, if they endure emotional distress, there's remedies, financial remedies for that as well. But again, this is unique and this is going to be, we're gonna be going into a bit of uncharted territory in many ways because we're not talking about a business who might have assets and we, we're gonna be looking at someone's per, potentially personal finances or what resources they have um, if we're talking about um, monetary damages. Um, again, so we are looking at creative approaches um, and I think restorative justice may be a particularly useful tool um, in this, um, in enforcing and, and remedying the violations of, of this provision. Uh, that's great, thank you. Um, one thing you said I want to draw out a little further because I think it's important. Uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance did a survey and um, it reflected a lot of concern on the part of domestic workers to come forward with complaints both out of concern that uh, immigration status will be kind of weaponized in the ways that you talked about. So I think it's important to underline um, you'll have protections as a, you know, if we extend the law on a lot of different grounds, not only race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, but immigra uh, immigration status. And so that is a violation of your rights under the law. Um, 
that by itself will not protect you uh, from ICE, but it, it builds a set of protections that the city can provide and show up with. The, the other concern that I saw in the data was a concern about retaliation, that if you bring a complaint forward, you'll be at risk of being fired for complaining. So can you just speak to uh, how the law protects against retaliation if you bring a complaint forward to the court? Sure. Um, so retaliation under the city human rights law is illegal. That means that if you engage in what's called a protected activity, which includes making a complaint either to your employer directly or to an agency like mine or participating in an investigation at an agency like the commission, um, you cannot be um, subjected to an adverse action, which could be firing or reduction in pay, schedule reduction in scheduling um, or other forms of, of what would essentially prevent someone from coming forward again. An important new addition to our law that was implemented just last week adds that requesting a reasonable accommodation is now a protected activity under the city human rights law. It had not actually been. Um, so that, and I think this will be very important when this, if this bill um, becomes law, Requesting an accommodation for pregnancy or for a disability, um, one cannot be subjected to firing straight away because they requested that accommodation that they are legally entitled to. That was a bit of a loophole in our law and that was closed, um, and so that's a really important one. So retaliation is something we take very seriously. Um, in fact, if we know that a worker is experiencing retaliation in real time, we have a pre-complaint intervention unit that will address that immediately. That means calling the employer right away and saying you cannot do this, this is another violation of the city human rights law, sending a cease and desist letter or other sort of immediate actions that the commission can take. Um, again, it doesn't prevent someone from being retaliated against, it's just we can convey that that is, that will subject them to further liability. Um, but we know that again, it happens, it's real, um, but we do what we can as quickly as we can to ensure that that behavior stops. And maybe let me ask you then to echo a little more on the, the hard side of enforcement. I think what you said before about restorative justice is wonderful in those cases where there is a willingness, but let's say someone fires someone for complaining and you've let them know that they're not allowed to do that, but they do it anyway, so maybe it's past the point where a restorative justice approach will work, like what's the hammer of the law and, and how does it work to protect workers who, who might be retaliated against despite their rights? Right, um, our law, Again, as a civil law enforcement agency, our law provides um, money damages. So in a case where someone um, advocates for their rights and is terminated, um, there will be essentially what's called front pay. So from the time they were let go until the time they are able to get a job of equal, um, sort of equal pay, um, same conditions, we can seek to get damages to account for that lost wages. In addition to that, many people experience emotional distress from the discrimination, from the retaliation, and in our legal system, we attach money value to that harm. Um, again, not a perfect system, but it is, it, there may be some real damages, including um, you know, seeking um, mental health services or medical services or other things that might have, uh, we could attribute dollar value to, but in addition to that, the emotional harm the law allows for us to attribute money to. So there are damages available to people, money available to people for that harm. Um, and then in addition, we can enforce the law in any way or, or assign affirmative relief in any way that effectuates the purpose of the city human rights law. So that will, that, and we've taken, we've gotten quite creative in what that means. That will typically include requiring the employer does training, requiring the employer, you know, educate themselves on their rights, report back, uh, on their obligations, excuse me, report back to us. It may involve more restorative practices, including community service, um, a mediated apology, a written apology letter. Um, these are all things that we've started to employ in our, in our practice. So um, damages, penalties potentially paid to the city of New York, um, and then other forms of, of required action like trainings and things like that. Thank you. Um, and I'll also just associate myself with Councilmember Rose's questions. You know, we had a long exchange about this at the hearing on this bill last term. And I think um, helping people find, you know, especially if it's a situation of like, uh, you know, an, an older person, you know, hiring someone that's going to be their personal uh, aid or assistant or home health or, 
you know, the, where the line is between protecting from discrimination on the one hand and being able to hire someone from your community in your neighborhood who knows how to prepare the food that you eat or religious, you know, rules that you have to follow. I think if there, if there is some way to figure out how to do this in a way that protects people from discrimination but allows for that kind of, you know, this sort of community and familial networks that are such a big part of care in our communities, that'll be an important, an important goal. Um, two final questions, or maybe I'll, um, yeah, uh, this bill is great, I fully support it, um, I'm glad we're doing it. Um, I think it relates to a couple of areas where I think other cities are going even further, and maybe we could go even further, so I just wanna ask about those. I noticed that Seattle and Philadelphia have both passed now domestic worker Bill of Rights 2.0, packages that start to go to benefits and stronger protections and training and um, I hope that we'll be able to after we pass this move forward to that together I just wonder if you guys have been you know uh, as part of your outreach and conversation looking at any of those issues and have preliminary thoughts on them so um, I would I I'm not in a position to share preliminary thoughts um, at this hearing, but I'm happy to 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 have conversations going forward. Um, I think, you know, the council in creating the paid care division within uh, our Office of Labor Policy Standards, that was a formative and important step so that um, we're not only monitoring what other municipalities and, and localities are doing throughout the country to make sure that we're keeping pace if not leading um, on those issues, um, but also uh, making sure that we're leveraging our, our constituencies, um, including our, our worker groups um, and the like, uh, to ensure that, that we're um, proactive and, and able to um, you know, uh, serve these folks um, and uh, be responsive. And I'll say that um, we watch sort of what other municipalities are doing pretty closely and are part of some networks of um, human rights commissions around the country um, and really will be, um, I have on my to-do list, picking up the phone and calling our counterparts in Philadelphia um, to talk a little bit about their plans for implementation and, um, and some of the other cities that have moved a little bit further than, than New York City on this issue um, to ensure that we're sort of building off of their expertise. While the cities are different and the communities are different, um, it, it, you know, we wanna make sure that we are sort of in collaboration and sharing best practices. So um, on the area that we have jurisdiction over, I can't really speak to, to benefits right now or to um, some of the work that DCA does. Um, that is a conversation that we regularly have and we'll very much engage with the other um, cities that have moved ahead. That's great, and, and just to kind of validate on that, you know, Commissioner Malalas came to the meeting this summer of Local Progress, our national network of progressive local elected officials that included Teresa Mosqueda, who is the lead sponsor of the 2.0 package in Seattle and, and presented on some of the great work here, but was also there to, to learn from others. So thank you for that. Um, and my final question on sort of next steps is, um, you know, the, the, one of the reasons, it's not that we specifically excluded domestic workers, they have not been covered because our law has a four-person cutoff and, and most domestic workers are just the one uh, worker. We've, this will be a great step forward to get domestic workers covered. In a, in a bill that we passed a few weeks ago, we said that if you have sort of independent contractors, they can be counted. But now we're in this position where like, I don't know why people who happen to have precisely two or three or one employee and no domestic workers and no independent contractors are allowed to violate people's human rights because of an odd little loophole in our law. So, um, you know, if we were to bring forward a bill to just eliminate that loophole altogether and say everybody was protected by the coverage of the human rights law, um, uh, what would you think of, of that? Um, I think my, our, my, my handlers here would not want us to comment on bills without seeing the bill language, but I do agree, um, you know, in, in, in sort of the, the philosophy that we're, we're sort of, we're getting to that place where we're closing in on these very small workplaces that are actually formalized workplaces, thinking about very small um, offices, medical offices, for example, that, ha that might have, you know, a doctor, a receptionist, and maybe someone else, on a bookkeeper or something. Um, and I think that that, that, that universe is, is narrowing, but it exists. And um, 
I think we're very open to, to thinking through um, how we sort of cover that, that, that last gap um, as far as the jurisdictional limit goes. Great, and I think actually some of the work on domestic workers that you spoke about with Councilman Burroughs will be helpful there too. Like obviously if you've got a very small business and you hire your kid, you know, like that's not a discrimination against people who don't look or pray like your kid. So how we, sh I think the, the way that you're approaching showing the, some flexibility to protect all workers, but be thoughtful about the kinds of, you know, of, pat of, of small workplace issues um, are valuable as well. All right, uh, thank you very much for all this time, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you guys for your work on this issue. Thank you very much, Councilmember Lender. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, could you tell us if the Commission is aware of uh, a claim that the domestic workers are often uh, also victim of labor trafficking, or if they are trading to be deported because of the immigration situation? And also what step the Commission have been taking to mm -hmm. handle this situation? Um, I'm very well aware of that um, dynamic and, um, and in fact, I spent several years um, representing domestic workers um, while working as an attorney at Safe Horizon um, in the anti-trafficking program. Almost all of my clients at the time were uh, labor trafficked domestic workers. Um, and um, it is, a, it is um, a, it, it, it's terrible, it's horrific. I, I, I would not pretend to be able to explain it um, you know, here today, um, but it, it demonstrates the intrinsic vulnerability of people who are, as you've said before, often immigrants, often um, coming here for um, you know, their sliver of the American dream or their slice of the American dream. And um, it, it involves exploitation based on, in many circumstances, fears around immigration enforcement. Um, it may involve uh, one's identity documents like their passport or their visa being taken from them so that they are um, attached to their employer in ways that um, will, will um, sort of foster further vulnerability. Um, they may not be paid any wages at all. The, the money, if they are paid, might be sent to uh, people in their home country or maybe withheld from them entirely. Um, and they may not be able to freely leave um, the, the building or the apartment or the house, um, sometimes at all, sometimes under very limited circumstances. Um, it is an area that I think overlaps with discrimination in many, in many ways. There are actually very good federal laws that, that provide rights to victims of trafficking. Um, it, there's the Federal Trafficking Victims Protection Act um, that allows for victims to bring civil claims against their traffickers for lost wages and emotional distress and many other damages. Um, and that was some of the work that I had done several years ago was using the federal law, in fact, to, um, to provide, to seek justice for, for, for our clients. Um, there certainly, as I mentioned, there is an overlap between protections under the city human rights law. As I mentioned, to use threats of ICE or in immigration enforcement against a worker um, would be a violation of the city human rights law under immigration status or national origin discrimination. Um, if there is sexual harassment, that is again another area where, um, or, or sexual abuse, um, that would potentially overlap with the city human rights law. I should also mention that there are likely criminal um, legal implications here, um, so that there might be criminal law violations as well, or certainly if it's trafficking, there are criminal violations as well. Um, so that oftentimes um, the first, potentially the first call may be um, to uh, law enforcement, not, not my agency, but um, the NYPD or others um, to help get someone out of that situation. Once they are out and they are seeking remedies, um, the city human rights law may, might be able to provide some of those remedies as do other, um, as do other parts of both the New York State labor law um, and the federal um, Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Um, I had one other thing that I wanted to say and now I've lost it. Um, but we, you know, just to conclude, it's, it's an area that we are very, oh, I did wanna say one more thing. The commission several years ago announced that we are a U visa certifier and we have provided declarations in support of T visas, which is a trafficking visa. Um, as a civil law enforcement agency, we can certify for one's U visa if we have jurisdiction to investigate a violation of the city human rights law and we can detect 
a qualifying crime as part of the, our investigation that most commonly comes up in the context of sexual harassment that rises to criminal sexual abuse or forcible touching. Um, and so that is another way that we um, have made our venue um, a space for people to come forward with these kinds of claims. Um, again, we've, we've been um, limited by the four employee minimum uh, other than gender-based harassment, but that would potentially expand um, uh, you know, the venue for people um, to seek U visa certification. Um, we cannot provide U visas or T visas. We are a, an enforcement agency that could provide the certification as part of the larger application, um, which is ultimately decided by the federal, um, the federal USCIS. Um, so just wanted to, to um, inform folks of that and also just know that that is definitely an area that both myself and Commissioner Malalas have direct experience representing folks in those situations. <coughs> Thank you. Deputy Commissioner, uh, uh, do, what we are looking is to remove the requirement, the four employers requirements, protection, and extend the protection to all domestic workers. This is something very important. And that's when also more people will be protected. And you will have the commission and the consumer affair will have also to serve more people. The work is going to be bigger. You will have more work, more responsibility in order to ensure that everybody, everyone is protected under this law. And in your testimony, you say that, Deputy Commissioner, if this bill passes, the commission is committed to or to working with domestic workers, advocates, or sisters agency in domestic workers employer networks to ensure New Yorkers know what their right and obligation and are under this provision. This is more work, more tasks. This is bigger than what you are doing now because you got to include everybody now and you are, we have to make sure, or you have to make sure that everybody get protected. And then uh, that's to bring us to the same question of funding, of resources. If you have more work, I think you will need more resources, more, more funding. But this is not exactly my question because we, had, we asked this question several times, and you answer several times also. But I just want to reinforce, to put emphasis on that, we do believe that the commission will need more resources to handle this, uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, uh, the commission can deliver on this uh, very important uh, uh, circumstances. And uh, now, could you tell us, are you going, what you're going to do to ensure that you reach that goal that you mentioned in your testimony, that everyone can know their right and everyone can have access to the protection? What the commission will do to reach that goal, in addition to resources, but anyway, what the commission will do, what are the steps, what, sure, I think and what the commission will do differently mm -hmm. in addition that, uh, of what the commission is doing right now. One of the most important things that we can do, given that we cannot be in every zip code, in every playground, in every community space or church or mosque or synagogue across the city, is we can build, continue. Excuse me, uh, just so you know, I want to, to interject why you cannot be in every church and everywhere and every place is why you know maybe we can if we do you know if we if we schedule ourselves <laughs> really really precisely but assuming we probably can't um given but because i think that the commission <laughs> is serving the entire city of new york people from the churches the most the synagogue everywhere why you cannot go there well one thing that we can do is we can <laughs> leverage and again or build connections with as many of those institutions trusted institutions as we possibly can along with all of the community based organizations that are on the ground every single day so that if we meet with with a community based organization that message then gets disseminated delivered you know it's a it's a it's a way that we can really um, get our message out into the world by meeting with community leaders, by, by meeting with faith leaders, by meeting with community-based advocates and organizations. Um, again, because if we, if we can partner with one or two people in those, in, in, representing that larger community, 
we hope that they can kind of be our surrogates and can get the, the word out. So we've done that. Um, we will continue to do that and continue to build more of those connections and those relationships um, and, and get our literature out, get our names and phone numbers out. Hopefully, if we can, look, be a familiar face in as many of those spaces as we can. Um, and that's for the worker, the worker side of things, making sure that we are, again, accessible, available, and building connections throughout c communities. Um, on the employer side of things, that is where I think we, we again, have to be a little bit creative. They're hand in hand, and, and, and other organizations are doing incredible work working with domestic worker employers. We will work with them on that, but I think they people are not only domestic worker employers they are also employees they are also members of um you know houses of worship as well and we can reach them as members of community um and also remind them that not only are they workers themselves but they're also employers um, and so that's some of the work that we have to do and it's it's really just getting strategic and and building connections so that people can share, disseminate, help us share information um, with the broader community. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner, and, and thank you, sir. Uh, Council Member Wood, do you have any other question? Uh, no, I'm good, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So with this, I, I just want again to thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner, and, uh, and All of you who are working on behalf of the hardworking people, the domestic workers, and I think we have the moral mandate to do everything that we can do that everyone in New York City or in our great nation can be protected under the law. They have the right, you know, to be protected like everybody. They have the right to be served, and I think that this is a very important step that we are taking by ensuring that all those the, 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 the domestic workers can be protected, can be treated fairly, regardless of the language they speak, the place where they come. I think they deserve that, and we are doing a wonderful job. And again, to all of you, felicidades. Vamos a seguir luchando juntos, trabajando duro, porque tenemos nosotros la ciudad de Nueva York, tenemos la obligación la obligación de proteger todos ustedes. Again, felicidades a todos ustedes. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now. Now we are going to call the next panel. Nam Neta or Nam Reta Proden. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your, your name. Margareta? Margareta. Is that Margareta? Please, thank you very much. Mariba Santano, Santeno, thank you. From National Domestic uh, Workers Alliance, Alison Julien. From National Domestic Workers Alliance, Guadalupe Pareta. Thank you very much uh, for your. I just while while you're getting together, I just wanted to say um, to all of you that were present, you know how much I value the work that you do 
you are valued. I am so glad that we're at this point today where um, this legislation is having a hearing. And I just want you to know we're going to continue to fight for, um, for intro 339 to be passed because um, domestic workers are entitled to the same rights as every other worker. And we're not going, I'm not going to stop until that happens. So I want to thank you. I, um, thank you. I have another hearing that I, I have to go to. So I, I don't want you to think that your testimony isn't important to me. Um, I will make sure that I, I get it and, um, and I will respond. So um, thank you, thank you again for, for all of your efforts and we're gonna continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rose. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. And thank you very much uh, to all of you from the panel. Thank you for coming to testify. And thank you for the work you are doing on behalf of the, all our brothers and sisters who are trying to make a living, to strive, and to make it in America like everybody. But uh, for the sake of time, because we have about 20, over 20 speakers, so we're going to limit it the time of two minutes each, all right? All right, please, you may start, anyone may start, but please, before that, state your name, please. Good morning. My name is Marisa Centeno. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today. I am representing the National Domestic Workers Alliance. I am New York co-director, and we have a chapter of over 5,000 domestic worker contacts uh, here in New York City. And we, I have been working, personally I've been working um, for the past four years specifically on enforcing domestic worker rights. Our organization, our affiliates, and our worker members strongly um, urge the passage of intro 339 to include domestic workers in the full um, inclusion in human rights law in New York City. Um, we know that you're gonna hear from workers all across the city today, and their stories are real. Uh, the work that I do is to enforce domestic worker rights, and I hear stories every single day about the injustices of domestic work in the domestic workplace. And we have a program that actually um, deb almost deputizes worker leaders to go out into the communities and they are learning how to talk to other domestic workers about their rights. And through our worker-led enforcement program, we have helped over 300 domestic workers come to our domestic worker legal clinic. And even though discrimination is not covered under uh, the current um, workplace protections, we know that through just through our uh, legal clinic alone, between 15 and 18 percent of domestic workers who come forward with other workplace violations indicate that they have had and experienced discrimination. The types of discrimination that they experience are pregnancy, uh, gender-based harassment, caregiving around race, alienage, uh, and citizenship, uh, immigration, and age. And so we hear uh, what happens when there is no framework or structures to how employers should treat employees in the domestic workplace. We know that it's possible to enforce and implement because we have been building a framework. Excuse me, let, let me say something. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yes. But I said two minutes. When okay. The, when the bell rings, that means the time is over. Oh, okay. But Sorry. because of the importance of uh, this topic, mm -hmm. and I know that you work so hard, instead of two minutes, I'm going to give you three minutes. Yeah, well, this thank is you. very important. <laughs> but I, the reason that we, we, we have to time you, you Absolutely. Guys, because I, I got to go to another, you know, a hearing. And yes. also we got about 20 people, but instead of two, yes. you're going to have three minutes. All right? What okay, I would you. like to but highlight. But when, when the bell rings, that's means Thank somebody you. else will start. Got it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
What I just want to highlight is that in my testimony, which is a, a more extensive written testimony, we do um, highlight the ways that we've been able to engage with domestic workers, the ways that we engage uh, with the city agencies and how we use co-enforcement to ensure that we're able to implement the laws um, and enforce the laws that are actually um, available to domestic workers. More and more workers are able to come forward um, with their stories and share their voices um, and also change the workplace industry. I will encourage that this is not a uh, one solution, but part of a solution to addressing gender inequity uh, within New York City. So the Commission on Human Rights will need more resources. So will the Department of Consumer um, and Worker Protections and the Division of Paid Care. These are all agencies we've been working really closely and have actually already started to build a structure around which implementation and enforcement is possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Eh? And thank you okay. well, what time is to it? the committee and bill sponsor for having you here and for sharing my testimony. I'm Namrata Pradhan, and I'm a domestic worker okay. organizer with NDWA and domestic and with Adhikar. I'm also on the National Domestic Worker Alliance Board of Directors. I was discriminated because of my figure for as long as I can remember, and I was also criticized all the time. I was struggling to grow. My parents did the best they could. They encouraged me to play basketball and gymnastic even though I did not want to. I just, I just loved playing hockey and I was the best in my team. My parents took me to the sea specialist in Delhi, India, that could not but could not continue with all of the tests and follow up because I was in the middle school and ready for the high school. I just want to focus on my studies and was really, really irritated with all that criticism about me. I've never spoken before about being discriminated against me as a professional nanny. I have been waiting for the perfect time to speak up. I have never ever shared this to anyone, not even in my organizational home, Adhikar and NDWA. I have more than 15 years of experience as a nanny and almost 10 years of experience as a domestic worker leader and an organizer. All through these years, our worker members see me as a fun-loving person and as an organizer. I have made connection by being hilarious. They have only seen the bright side of my, of my face, despite what I have gone through to my lifetime. I know what it means to be discriminated against. I will share now my workplace discrimination story. Before raise, being raised in a Hindu family and believing in a karma before starting each day and we offer prayers and receive blessings on our forehead. I, I preserved my culture from Nepal to here to the, in the United States, where I worked as a nanny. With this, I worked, my, I worked and being a Hindu faith on my forehead called Tika. When I went to work for one particular family as a part-time nanny, they did not know what that symbol of faith mean to. My employer didn't like, like it. He told me to get rid of this. It looks like a black magic. I tried to explain to my employers that taking care of the kids requires a lot of vigilance. One has to be alert with the surroundings. Their behaviors it changes daily, and one needs to be know how to handle each situation with care. I explained that as part of my faith, with blessings in my forehead is what symbolically means me to be the best I can be when caring for the children in my charge. But my employer just kept repeating it in a kind of black magic. She created a difficult situation for me and didn't allow me to wear my tikka on my forehead. She left me with a very difficult choice, which for me and my faith was no choice except to leave the job. Even though this happened a long time and did not share with any of my colleagues, I lost my job because of my religion. All these years has haunted me in my heart and made me feel smaller than ever. But the, but the time is now. Today I'm speaking up and letting you all know that it's not okay to discriminate, discriminate against domestic workers. Domestic workers are human beings like other workers. Domestic workers need to live with life 
with respect and dignity and without discrimination. Thank you. Thank you so very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Guadalupe Paleta y soy miembro de la organización Se Hace Camino a Nueva York. Estoy aquí para exponer mi caso y que sea escuchado, ya que no soy la única que ha vivido esta experiencia. Good morning. My name is Guadalupe Paleta and I'm a member of the organization Se Hace Camino, Make the Road. I'm here to, exp to explain my case and have it heard, being that I'm not the only one that has gone through this experience. Es importante que las leyes laborales apliquen a todos los trabajadores por igual, sin excluir a las trabajadoras domésticas de protecciones críticas. It's important that uh, labor laws apply to all workers equally, without exclusion of uh, domestic workers of uh, critical protections. Yo trabajé con una señora como trabajadora doméstica. Yo iba a su casa a trabajar tres veces por semana por cuatro años. I worked with a, with a woman as a domestic worker, I would go to her house to work three times a week for four years. La señora empezó a abusarme verbalmente desde mi segundo día de empleo y siguió abusándome regularmente. Ella, ella me gritaba, Estoy, estás aquí en Nueva York para trabajar y limpiar porque eres inmigrante. Y me decía groserías. Me decía que no podía entenderme cuando le hablaba por mi acento. The woman uh, started abusing me verbally from the second day of my employment, and she continued abusing me regularly. She would scream at me, uh, you are here in New York to work and clean because you're an immigrant, and vulgarities also. She would tell me that she couldn't understand me but because of my accent. Cada día antes de entrar al apartamento, me obligaba a quitarme los zapatos y las medias y desinfectarme los pies. Me dijo que no podía usar el baño en su apartamento porque decía que podría pasarle alguna infección y que podría ser contagiosa. No me permitía comer en su apartamento. Every day before I entered the apartment, she forced me to take off my shoes and socks and disinfect my feet. She told me that uh, I couldn't use her bathroom in her apartment because uh, I could spread an infection and it could be contagious. She didn't even let me eat in her apartment. Mi jefa me acosaba y me ofendía regularmente, y yo me sentía enojada, humillada y triste. Y cada día tenía miedo de lo que ella iba a decirme. La señora me acusaba de ser ladrona y se quedaba en el apartamento para monitorearme mientras trabajaba. Lloré muchas veces mientras limpiaba y sus palabras me dolían mucho. My boss harassed me and offended me regularly. And I felt angry, humiliated and sad. And every day that she would tell me, she would talk to me. The woman uh, uh, accused me of being a thief, and she would stay in the apartment to monitor me during the, my work. I cried a lot, uh, many times, uh, while I was cleaning, and her words hurt me a lot. Un día mi hija fue conmigo al trabajo, y la señora no la dejó entrar en el apartamento, y la obligó a esperar abajo en el lobby. Luego la señora me dijo que tenía que limpiar la aspiradora. One day, my daughter went with me to work, and the woman didn't let her in the apartment, and she made her stay down in the lobby. After that, the woman asked me to clean the vacuum cleaner. Ella se enojó y me gritó, no entiendo, tienes que ir a la escuela para aprender inglés, porque no sabes. She got mad and she screamed at me, I don't understand you. You have to go to school to learn English because you don't know any. Luego, enojada, agarró la aspiradora y la botó en mis pies. Le dije que no era la manera correcta que me estaba tratando. Y ella me gritó, ¿Quién eres tú para decirme qué es correcto y qué no? Later on, uh, she grabbed the uh, vacuum cleaner and she threw, threw the dirt on the floor. She told, I told her, that's not a way to, to treat anyone. That is not correct. And she screamed at me, who are you to tell me what is correct and what is not correct? You're an ignorant immigrant. Eres una inmigrante ignorante. Me sentí frustrada y humillada, que me puse a llorar y, me, y no podía hablar. Ella se salió al lobby y dijo a mi hija, tienes que llevar a tu madre a la escuela para, para estudiar inglés. I felt frustrated and humiliated that she put, it made me cry and I couldn't speak. 
She went out into the lobby and told my daughter, you have to take her to, to your mother to school and to teach her so she could learn English. Mi hija subió al apartamento y cuando tuve a mi hija frente a mí, yo agaché la cabeza y mi hija repitió lo que la señora le había dicho de mí. En ese momento sentí dolor y rabia que mi hija me hubiera visto así. My daughter went up to the apartment and when she came in uh, in front, I put my head down and my daughter repeated that what the woman had told me. In that moment, I felt pain. I was annoyed that my daughter would see me in that way. Mi hija me abrazó y me dijo, vámonos, pero yo me quedé trabajando porque necesitaba ese dinero. My daughter hugged me and told me, let's go, but I needed to stay work. I stayed working because we needed the money. Me quedé trabajando con la señora por más de, de un año después de esto, porque necesitaba ahorrar dinero para mi hija, que tenía el sueño de ir a la universidad. Al final, la señora me despidió después de años de abuso, sin pagarme mis últimos dos meses. I remained working with that woman for more than two years after that, because I needed to save money for my daughter, which had the dream of going to the university. At, at the end, the woman fired me after two years of abuse, without paying me my last two months. Nosotras las trabajadoras domésticas no estamos protegidas por la ley en la ciudad de Nueva York. En caso de discriminación o abuso. We domestic workers are not protected by law in, in cases of discrimination or abuse. Por esto los empleadores se sienten protegidos mientras abusan de nosotras y nuestro trabajo. That's why the employers feel protected uh, while they abuse us and our jobs. Necesitamos que tomen acción contra los, contra los empleadores abusadores. Y espero que esta nueva ley sea una protección para nuestros derechos. We need action to be taken against the abuse, abusing employers. And we expect that this new law is a protection for us and our, and our rights. No surge adoptar la propuesta de ley número 339 de la, de la Ley de Derechos Humanos para extender las protecciones contra discriminación en el trabajo de las trabajadoras domésticas. We urge you to adopt the proposal of, lay, of law number 339, the law of human rights law, to extend the protections against discrimination in the workforce of domestic workers. Muchas gracias. Very, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Sure. Uh, greetings. My name is Allison Julian. I'm the co-director of the New York chapter for um, uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance. And this morning, I'm going to share the testimony on behalf of one of the members of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Uh, the workers' experience is extremely graphic, and only a small fraction of her story is being offered here today for her testimony. In the early 1990s, I started my profession as a domestic worker, and for over 20 years, I have worked as a nanny. For over four years, I worked with a family in New York City providing care for two children. Almost two years after being hired, the mom became pregnant. Soon after, I noticed a change in the way she would interact with me. Oftentimes, she would become very upset and would scream at me constantly. Over the years, the verbal abuse continued. Once she raised her hand to hit me in the presence of her child, the employer felt she had the power over me because on any given day, she would determine my, ex she would undermine my experience and would scream in my face, calling me derogatory names and expressing her disgust with me. She would remind me I was illegal and threaten to call immigration on me and tell me they would send ICE to my home. Oftentimes I ignored her, but this time upon hearing her threats, I told her I was no longer returning to work. After I left that evening, the children ran into the hallway, begging me to come back. Of course I was hurt, because I'm a human being, and I have feelings too. And due to the constant abuse and humiliation I felt, my dignity was being stripped from me. After numerous calls from my employer and the thought of leaving the children heartbroken, I decided to return to work, but the abuse worsened. My wages were withheld, and I was not paid for the week worked, but was instead paid the following week. This was another way they were trying to control me and continued for several months. There were also numerous threats of blacklisting made by the employer. She was certain I was never going to be a nanny again. 
Through all of the abuse, I continued working with the family, doing the best job I could to provide love and care for the children in my charge, cleaning their homes and laun doing laundry for the entire family. Earlier this year, the abuse escalated. I decided it was enough, and at this point, I decided to quit again. As I waited for the dad to return so I could be paid for the previous week and the day's work this week in particular, again, I endured threats of immigration. As I was leaving, the employer screamed increase, and within seconds, she proceeded to physically attack me. I was injured, but eventually I was able to escape and seek help. I know my story is not unique in the domestic worker industry. However, workers should not have to endure discrimination in the workplace without protections in order to make a living wage to support themselves and their families. Domestic work is hard work and working under these conditions lead to increased workplace stress, hostile working conditions. Domestic workers like myself across New York should not have to endure these kinds of abuse in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you speaking, sir? Thank you. <clears throat> to all of you uh, from the panel, thank you so very much. And then so thank you to you for your courage, for sharing with us uh, your experience. Thank you so much. And you know that we are all in this together. We are working together to make sure that all domestic workers, you know, are protected. Thank you so very much. Have a nice day. Thank, thank you. you. We are calling the next panel. Tatiana Beyer, be, I believe, from uh, Domestic uh, Employers Network. Rachel Cahan from Domestic uh, Employers Network. Flora Margaris from Domestic uh, Employers Network. Rena Stabin from uh, Domestic Worker Network. And Jimena Frankel from Domestic uh, Employers Network. As you know, the, the, uh, we, we are forced to limit it, you know, your speech to three minutes. It was two, but it's three now. Uh, <laughs> but again, thank you so very much to, to all of you. You may start any time. Please state your name for the record. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tatiana Bejar. I am Good afternoon. New York a City Organizer at Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of our membership. Hand in Hand uh, is a national network of employers of nannies, house cleaners, and home attendants, our families, and allies. We support domestic employers improve their employment practices and believe that dignified and respectful working conditions benefits worker and employer alike. We envision a future where people live in caring communities that recognize all of our interdependence. Hand in Hand strongly supports Intro 339, New York City must not exclude domestic workers from protections that other workers enjoy. The New York City human rights law is one of the most progressive laws of this kind in the United States. And employers of domestic workers uh, in New York City are by and large beneficiaries of these progressive laws and have a larger safety net of benefits through which they have recourse of enforcement if something were to go terribly wrong in their workplaces. Hand in hand members are acutely aware that their privilege they have as employers is also a responsibility they carry for their domestic worker employees. It makes little sense for the vast majority of employers of domestic workers to be covered by the human rights law, yet their employees are not. Employers of domestic workers often do not have any guidance on how to fairly treat domestic workers they employ and rely on each other's social network to do so. By passing this bill, Intro 339, it will be the first part of a framework of implementation and support. 
As more and more New Yorkers are needing care of various kinds, the need to address some of the longest lasting injustice are past due. More New Yorkers will welcome employers as the care work industry expands and now is the time to set up healthy frameworks of domestic employment. When done with care and understanding, many employers want to be given guidance on how to address workplace accommodation, support workers through employment, and set up healthy professional boundaries within the home. All employers should have the chance to become better employers, which will make the New York City a better place uh, to work. At hand in hand, we urge the New York City Council to also strongly consider providing added budget to the Commission on Human Rights to be able to properly provide the recommendations for implementation and to be able to carry out thoughtful enforcement. Increased budget and capacity for the pay care division to help outreach and educate domestic employers. And as we hear earlier, this is really fundamental, important to be creative, uh, to have outreach strategies to employers and to educate, and especially employers who also do not speak English. Funding for a city-wide media campaign that begins to shift societal perceptions and norms around domestic work discrimination. So domestic work is one of the fastest growing occupational sectors and the one in which women in particular, women of color, are overrepresented. We urge the state to support a feminist workforce agenda by passing intro 339. We, okay, I think I made my points clear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. <laughs> um, good morning, my name is Rachel Kahn. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Rachel Kahn. I'm a member of Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network. I live in Brooklyn, and I'm currently the domestic employer of a nanny and house cleaners. As a working mother, having a paid caregiver is truly invaluable to me, so I'm here to share my enthusiastic support um, for Intro 339 to provide protection for domestic workers. Um, because America is the only industrialized nation with no guaranteed maternity leave time, my children were 11 weeks old when I went back to work. And I'm very fortunate that I earned enough to hire a nanny to care for them in my home. Um, that care is really the thing that makes it possible for me to earn a living to support my family and to contribute my skills to our economy. I believe that every working woman deserves to be treated with respect for her professional skills, whether she's a white collar professional in a corner office, a nanny, a house cleaner, an elder care worker, a home health aide. Too often I see these women, who are nearly all women of color or immigrants, treated without the basic dignity that everyone is entitled to. And I'm here because I believe in the equality of women and workers. Um, to expect domestic workers to work without the kind of protection that these human rights laws would cover them with is asking, in effect, for them to subsidize their employers' lifestyles by giving up an essential protection that these same employers expect to have in their own workplaces. Um, two years ago, one of the nannies who works in my building was subjected to repeated sexual harassment by a doorman in our building. She was undocumented. She was afraid to ask for help. She told me, he works for this building and I just work in this building. And it was her place of employment. This was her workplace. But she felt that she had no recourse because as a domestic worker, she ranked lower than the building staff and the building residents. Um, I was on the condo board at the time, and I had him fired the next day. But in my own peer group, I can add my own testimony to what we've heard already from the domestic workers who've spoken. I've seen nannies dismissed because they were pregnant. I've seen neighbors of mine threaten to call ICE when their nannies tried to negotiate fairer pay. Too often, domestic workers are treated as machines, as though they have to keep working no matter what, simply because of the work they do. Um, this perpetuates discrimination and bad behavior by other employers who feel entitled to exploit domestic workers. So I call on the New York City Council to ensure their right to a safe workplace in our homes by passing Intro 339. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good morning. My name is Rhea Sturban, and I'm here to testify in favor of Intro 339. I'm a mother of two young children, and I live in Astoria, Queens. I'm a domestic employer and a member of Hand in Hand, the Domestic Employers Network. I work in a fast-paced field where time away from work means losing opportunities to learn the technology that will keep me employed next year. When my son was born, I wanted him to have the focused attention I would have given him if I'd been able to stay home. I was very lucky to find incredible women to pro provide care for my children. Michelle and Lital were my kids' nannies in their first years, and currently I employ Lupe to care for them after school. 
Although I led small teams at my job, I felt very much at sea when it came to having someone whose job and livelihood I'd be responsible for. I knew I wanted to build a good relationship with my nanny and make sure the job I was offering was a fair one, but I had no idea what that might look like. Before I got involved with Hand in Hand, I reached out to a friend who works as a nanny about what I should do. She told me to remember that my nanny's work was just as important as my work and to treat her with the same consideration I'd expect at the office. Because of her advice, I was able to create a fair working environment and develop a good relationship with Michelle, but I had to figure out so much on my own. What, ages, what wages and hours are fair? What benefits should I offer her? How do I make sure that I'm not taking advantage of her? In my own job, there are rules that ensure I can work in a safe environment and that I have a way to seek justice when I'm taken advantage of. I have protections against sexual harassment and I can expect accommodations when I'm pregnant and I can't lose my job because of it. That's because what I do is seen as a career, as real and important work. The work that Lupe does for me, the work that Michelle and Lee's Hall did, which has made my work possible, deserves those same protections. It's not fair to ask them to weigh the risk of being fired when deciding whether or when to have children. Domestic workers deserve the right to choose for themselves how they want to ba balance a family and a career. Passing intro 339 will ensure that nobody gets to take that choice away from them. As a working mother and a feminist, I owe so much to Mich Michelle, Lital, and Lupe, each of whom entered our home with grace and experience to do the hard and often invisible labor of helping to raise my children. I believe that dignified work should be everybody's right. As an employer, I believe domestic workers should be extended the same rights that so many workers have fought for and won over the years here in New York City. Passing intro 339 would help me and other families like mine be fair employers and provide better working conditions for domestic workers, affirming the dignity of their work. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Good morning, I'm Jimena Frankel. I'm also an organizer with uh, Hand in Hand and I'll be reading for Flora Margulies who had to leave. Um, good morning, my name is Flora Margulies and I live in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn. I'm a domestic employer and a member of Hand in Hand Domestic Employers Network. I currently employ a nanny and house cleaner. I'm here to share my enthusiastic support to Intro 339 because it affirms the dignity of domestic workers and protects them from all forms of discrimination. I have employed Namrata since 2012 to care for my two children. There is no compensation that can measure up to the care she has <coughs> provided. It is necessary to provide dignified working conditions to my employee. It is necessary that the woman I employ is able to work in an environment where she feels safe from discrimination or any harmful situations that can affect her dignity as a woman of color and an immigrant. I want to support her as she has <coughs> taken it on as her job to support my family. Going back to work with a five-month-old at home is not an easy decision to make, but Namrata made that possible. As a new mom, I made the decision to hire a nanny because I wanted to, the individual care that a nanny is able to give. I appreciated the support she was able to provide from working in our home. With her support, I was able to return to work in a way that felt right for our family. There is no <coughs> human resources department for me or Namrata to, run, to turn to. We have created a written contract which helps to make her roles and duties clear. We have an open dialogue and respect for one another. If she needs to change her schedule for religious holiday celebrations, this is something we're always open to so she feels comfortable and respected working in our home. Fairness and dignity are the conditions that allow us to be full human beings. When Namrata is more fully herself, my family benefits. Namrata has worked much of her life as a nanny in this country taking care of other people's children. Her work makes all other work possible. She needs to know that her work and her life are just as valued as mine, and that her job as a nanny is seen as dignified work just as mine is. I want her to know she can work anywhere free from all forms of discrimination. I'll also be reading for Emma Katz, who could not be here. I'm a domestic employer and a member of Hand in Hand Domestic Employers Network. I live in Jackson Heights, Queens, and like thousands of New Yorkers, I rely on domestic workers to take care of my children. It is in that capacity as a domestic employer that I am here today to speak in support of Intro 339 that would protect the women who work for my family from all any forms of discrimination. Because I am a working mother, I became an employer. I'm a small business owner and at my own workplace, I follow clear labor standards 
that protect my employees from discrimination based on religion, nationality, gender identity, pregnancy, among others. I believe the person I employ in my home should enjoy the same protections as the people I employ in my business. I would not be able to run my business without the important work that our nanny provides. My two small children are in her care from morning to evening, five days a week. I can work late on deadlines knowing that she will feed them healthy dinners. I can put my time and energy into growing my business knowing that she is there for my family. I owe the quality of my life to her care and I want her to have the same quality of life because our lives and our families are equally valuable. One of the reasons Intro 339 is so important to me is that it provides specific protection against age discrimination. Our nanny is like a grandmother to my children. They have known her since before they can remember. We value her years of experience caring for our children in our neighborhood, as well as her own children who are now grown. However, I know that her age puts her at risk of discrimination from future employees, and I want, from future employers, and I want her to have the same protection against discrimination that is afforded to workers outside the home. In valuing domestic work, you are valuing women's work and eliminating inequalities among working women. By saying that domestic workers like nannies, house cleaners, and home attendants deserve protections from all forms of discrimination, we are affirming that the care work is real, it is hard, and it is worthy as any office job. As a working mother, I'd say it's about time to set higher standards for all women. When we start accepting that caregiving is legitimate, we start to make things more equitable for all. I urge New York City Council to pass Intro 339 as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Now we are calling the next panel, Naoki Fujita from uh, Tech Road. Justice, Gabriela Siegel from Make the World the New York, Edna Fahengo from the Make the World New York, New York, and Krista Nade from Keith and King Household Staffing Agency. Any one of you may start any now, please, and state your name for the record before you start speaking. And remember that uh, your speech is uh, limited to three minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Gabriella Siegel and I'm a Skadden Fellow and Legal Advocate on the Workplace Justice Team at Make the Road New York. Thank you for the opportunity to share this testimony regarding protections for domestic workers under the New York City Human Rights Law. We strongly support the adoption of the expanded definition of employer to extend the protections of the human rights law to domestic workers. Make the Road New York is a nonprofit, community-based membership organization with over 24,000 low-income members dedicated to building the power of immigrant and working-class communities to achieve dignity and justice through organizing, policy innovation, transformative education, and survival services. Our workplace justice legal team represents hundreds of low-wage immigrant workers each year to enforce their rights under labor and employment laws. We frequently see domestic worker clients who have been discriminated against at work and as of now have no legal recourse under the New York City Human Rights Law. You've heard testimony from one of our clients and you will soon hear testimony from another. Domestic workers across New York City perform critical but often invisible work. Countless New Yorkers rely on domestic workers to clean their homes, look after their children, and care for their elderly family members and loved ones. And although domestic workers are entrusted with the care of those whom we hold most dear, they and their work are routinely devalued. Domestic workers are among the most exploited workers in New York. The most comprehensive study in New York City to date 
found that 50% of nannies and 26% of housekeepers interviewed had experienced a minimum wage violation in the prior week, and approximately 84% experienced overtime violations. These violations are often symptomatic of a broader culture of noncompliance and abuse where discrimination and exploitation go hand in hand. Our legal system has historically excluded domestic workers from the most basic labor protections afforded to other working New Yorkers. Additionally, domestic workers' physical isolation in private homes, coupled with fragmented and informal employment arrangements, present unique challenges to implementation and enforcement of their rights. Although many domestic workers are subject to sexual harassment and other forms of discrimination and intimidation, for much of this predominantly immigrant women workforce, fear of retaliation and deportation, limited English language proficiency, and limited awareness of their rights further heighten the likelihood of exploitation. The proposed amendment to extend the coverage of anti-discrimination provisions to domestic workers in New York City is particularly critical now. While New York City and New York State have made significant progress over the last decade, strengthening protections for domestic workers and undoing many of the historic carve-outs that denied them basic legal workplace protections, the persistence of certain exemptions sends employers a clear message that they can operate with impunity. Perhaps even more insidiously, the persistence of these carve-outs sustains the idea that domestic work is not in fact work or is somehow not deserving of the same protections as other industries and means that an employer of a domestic worker has fewer responsibilities than a regular employer. Thus, an employer may view domestic workers as interchangeable and replaceable, and an employer who believes they can get away with it may prefer, for example, to fire a pregnant worker than make accommodations. Domestic workers are entitled to the same assurance from our legal system that their dignity, well-being, and safety in their workplaces are worth protecting. We strongly encourage the adoption of this new legal protection. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker, please. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Edna Farinango y soy cliente de la organización Se Hace Camino Nueva York. Good, good day. My name is Edna Farinango and I'm a legal client of the organization Make the Road. Sufrí discriminación en mi trabajo y quiero hablar de mi experiencia personal en nuestro ámbito laboral por falta de, las, por falta de protección legal. And I suffer discrimination in my work environment and I want to speak to this because of the lack of protection for domestic workers. Laboré como trabajadora doméstica para una familia en el Upper West Side, limpiando apartamentos, lavando, planchando, preparando comida. I worked as a domestic worker for a family in the Upper East Side, cleaning the apartment, washing clothes, ironing. Tenía, al principio tenía buena relación con mis empleadores y siempre me decían que estaban a gusto con mi trabajo. At the beginning I had a good relationship with my employer and they always told me that they liked the work that I did. Cuando quedé embarazada de mi hija, se los dije y me aseguraron que estaba bien y que no afectaría mi empleo. When I was, found that I was pregnant with my daughter, I told them and they let me know that it will not affect my work. También les advertí que tendría que salir un poco antes de vez en cuando para asistir a mis citas médicas y me dijeron que no había ningún inconveniente siempre y cuando estuviera al tanto por adelantado. I also told them that because of my pregnancy I would have to leave early at work at times because of medical appointments and they let me know that there would not be any inconvenience as long as I told them beforehand. Unos días después me aseguraron otra vez que podía regresar a trabajar para ellos después de dar a luz. A few days later, they assured me that once I gave birth, I would be able to return to work for them. Confié en ellos y rechacé otra oferta que, de empleo que también me aseguraba trabajo durante y después de mi embarazo. And trusting in them, I rejected another job offer that would have assured me work during the time and after the pregnancy. Unos meses después, cuando pedí permiso por adelantado para salir a una cita médica, se enojaron conmigo y me contestaron que mi horario era de 8 de la mañana a 5 de la tarde. A few months later, when I asked for some time off, anticipating because of medical appointments, they got angry with me and answered me that my work schedule was 8 in the morning till 5 in the afternoon. Tenía que quedarme hasta las 5. En otra ocasión, me obligaron a trabajar en turno completo después de una cita médica en el cual me hicieron exámenes de sangre. 
I had to stay till 5 p.m. On another occasion, they obligated me to stay working after having gone to a medical appointment where they had given me a blood test. Esto a pesar que el med esto a pesar de que había pedido un descanso y el médico había aconsejado no trabajar ese día. Despite the fact that I had asked for a day off and the doctor had told me that I shouldn't work that day. Luego, ellos empezaron a cortar mis horas de forma gradual sin consultarme. Later, they started cutting my hours gradually without consulting me. Fui utilizada a su conveniencia cada vez que ellos me necesitaban nada más. I was always used to their convenience whenever they needed me. Cuando tenía aproximadamente siete meses de embarazo, la señora pidió hablar conmigo. When I was about seven months pregnant, the lady asked to speak with me. Al final de mi jornada, ella me dijo que no necesitaba más de mis servicios. At the end of my shift, she told me she no longer needed my services. Alegando que ella estaría al pendiente de su casa. Alleging that she would be the one taking care of her home. Pero luego me enteré al día siguiente de yo ser corrida, empezó a trabajar otra persona a tiempo completo. But later on, I found out the day after, after being fired that someone else was had the job and was working there full time que sigue trabajando hasta la actualidad. Whom still works there to the present time. Cuando fui despedida, le pregunté a la señora por qué, me había, por qué no me había avisado ya que era un trabajo del que yo dependía, del que dependía yo y mi familia. When I was let go, I asked the lady, why did you not uh, let me know beforehand considering that this job is how I support myself and my family. Quedarme sin trabajo fue un golpe duro porque estaba en un momento en el que más necesitaba porque iba a tener otro nue nuevo miembro en mi familia. Being without work was a very hard hit for me, especially at this moment that I needed the work because I was going to have a new member join our family. Nosotras, las trabajadoras domésticas, trabajamos en nuestra área porque consideramos que es un trabajo como cualquier otro digno de cualquier persona. Us domestic workers uh, work in this area and we consider that this job is like any other job but should be a dignified a dignified job like all other jobs. Sufrimos mucho por la ausencia de la protección que existe para otros trabajos. We suffer of the lack of protections that exist in other jobs. Esperamos que sea aprobada la ley número 339 para que no se, para que no sea legal la discriminación en este ámbito laboral. We hope the approval of the bill 339 so that its discrimination in this work area can is no law can be legal can no longer be legal. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Naoki Fujita. I'm a staff attorney with Take Root Justice. We provide legal services for domestic workers, and we are allied with organizations like NDWA and Adhikar. Um, I'll provide a brief version of my statement. Um, in the last two years, my organization has represented over 100 domestic workers against their employers as they pursue claims of wage theft, discrimination, and retaliation. We have been able to do this with funding received from private foundations, council member allocations, and appropriations under the Human Resources Agency. Over 95% of our domestic worker clients are women of color. The City Council took a huge step last year remedying the, this problem of discrimination by passing a package of sexual harassment protections that modified the human rights law to expand the protections against sexual harassment to include one person employers. Now it is time to pass intro 339 to give domestic workers protections against discrimination on the basis of race, immigration status, disability, pregnancy, and other protected categories. As a practitioner, I would like to share a few anecdotes to give the committee members a picture of what we see and hear every day from our clients who are domestic workers without identifying the particular names of employers or employees. We currently represent a domestic worker who was asked inappropriate, rep repeated questions about her pregnancy status. When her employer discovered that, they were, that she was pregnant, they terminated her immediately without further explanation. Our clients are subject to verbal abuse that is unimaginable in any other context outside of domestic work. Domestic workers who we represent report that they have endured comments such as mongrel, uh, one was told, you used to ride the back of the bus, and another was, was told by her employer, 
if you ever leave this job, I will call immigration and make sure that you never work again. Uh, <clears throat> it seems that people's worst prejudices and bigotries come out when they're just at home with their kids and the nanny, which is why the legislation known as Intro 339 is so needed. Uh, let me just conclude by saying, giving a little context of why we're here today and why this exclusion exists. Historically, domestic workers have been denied legal protections going back to the 1930s New Deal. Historian Jackson Cowie has written of that period, Southern congressmen united with Northern Do Democrats to create the New Deal, but the condition of that, of that participation was simple. The exclusion of the occupations into which Southern blacks were segregated, which were agriculture and domestic service. Today, the committee and New York City Council has the opportunity to create a new and more fair deal for domestic service by passing intro, intro 339. My clients and domestic workers in this city deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Krista Nader. I hold my bachelor's in arts in early childhood education. I'm a former classroom teacher and in private and public schools and also a former nanny here in New York City in several private homes here. Um, presently, I am the founder and president of a small business called Kith and Kin Household Staffing Agency, which is a nanny agency here that was founded in 2016. My company vets and introduces exceptional, qualified, and caring nannies to vibrant and respectful families in New York City. 95% of the families who become our clients have less than four staff members, so this would definitely affect them, but more so would greatly affect the agency of the candidates who come to my company seeking employment by our clients. As a former teacher, nanny, and now agency owner, I have encountered nannies who have shared stories with me that would make any reasonable person's skin crawl, including sexual harassment, touching, intimidation, threats, and wrongful termination. And you may wonder why any employee would stay in a position where they are treated poorly. And you may assume that that person to be uneducated, weak, or lazy, but however, that very belief that someone can simply quit a job can only occur within the inquirer whom has experienced a life with a degree of privilege to be able to just up and quit. With, within this industry that we work in, there's often a dynamic of ownership versus employership. And a fact that is highly problematic given that our nation was founded in no small part to the, the kidnapping and enslavement of humans from the land we stand on and continents oceans away. So that dynamic of ownership is threaded within everything that we do, uh, that domestic workers do. Today, these workers are often still on the fringes of society, working in homes of some of the most wealthy and powerful people in the United States, but yet because they themselves lack basic protection, protections held by workers in other sectors, they are often rendered powerless under the law, as if there was any difference between them working and the people they work for. So, when they are harassed, intimidated, and in some cases assaulted, they must choose between their personal dignity and safety, and putting a roof over their family's head. For we know the fate of an employee who dares to demand respect and professional boundaries from their superior. So by supporting this law, we have the unique chance to give the opportunity of personal empowerment and protection to the ones who make all other work in our society possible. So I, as an agency owner, I would also like to say that passing this law is of great importance so that other agencies who do similar work than I do can also stand on this leg and insist that the discriminations of the past not be repeated within our company's doors. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. We are calling the next panel. Dr. Isabel Cinero from Queens College, CUNY. Jocelyn Gorwigs Panitz from the Legal Aid Society. Megan Rocklin.
from a better balance Wagner, Casey Wagner. From Walker Institute. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, to all of you, I just want to remind you that uh, uh, your speech is limited to three minutes, and any one of you can start any time. But before you start speaking, would you please mention your name for the record? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Isabel Cuervo. I am a senior research associate at the Barry Commoner Center for Health and the Environment at Queens College City University of New York. I am part of a research team with partners from the Icon Medical School at Mount Sinai and Make the Road New York. Through a five-year research study funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, we are studying the work practices including the use of cleaning products with toxic cleaning chemicals, physical and mental health effects, and the working conditions of 400 Latinx domestic cleaners in New York City and surrounding areas. We are still collecting survey data, but preliminary results show that domestic cleaners, that is, workers whose jobs include cleaning apartments and houses as a major component, consistently work in multiple homes where working hours are usually from two to six hours, and often work in multiple homes in the same day. Nevertheless, job insecurity looms large as they must always navigate the variable preferences of those whose homes they clean. Domestic cleaners with which we spoke also indicated incidences of workplace harassment, including sexual harassment, discrimination because of the language they primarily speak, that is Spanish, and being an immigrant. Our research hopes to illuminate the experiences of these mostly marginalized women immigrants. They need protection so that they can safely and securely provide for their families here in the U.S. and back home in their home countries. They also offer the support for families to thrive to pursue their own contributions to this city. My mother is originally from Colombia and she also labored in this city as a domestic worker for over 30 years. Through her, I learned early on the physical and emotional toll that this insecure but honorable profession can take. Domestic workers should be recognized and protected to the fullest extent in the human rights law. And since I have more time, I would like to share a story uh, about my mother. Uh, in 1990, she um, suffered from, began suffering from osteoarthritis, and um, she was, had to go um, get her first surgery. And she was not able to get her job back, even though her employer promised that she, would able, she was able to return. And that actually opened the cascade for many years of her being unemployed because she was an older worker. Um, and so that led to her um, getting on public entitlement benefits uh, for over 10 years. Um, and so I'd like to, with my uh, professional and personal background, I would like to support this uh, revision to the law. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jacqueline goldswag and I'm a paralegal in the Employment Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Um, I'd first like to thank Councilmember Rose uh, for introducing this provision, Chair Eugene, and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Um, legal Aid, the nation's lar uh, oldest and largest legal services organization, strongly supports this provision to expand protections of the city's human rights law to domestic workers. We have represented numerous domestic worker clients in the past who faced workplace discrimination but did not have viable legal claims because of the limited definition of employer that we are discussing today. Um, in this regard, New York City is playing catch up. 13 U.S. states currently have anti-discrimination laws that both incorporate employers of less than four workers and protect domestic workers in their prohibition of employment discrimination. 14 when New York State's um, law comes into effect in February. New York City needs to be more progressive than the state 
as the city provides more protections than the state does uh, for employees. Uh, further, several other large and progressive cities have passed similar expansive anti-discrimination laws, including Chicago, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Detroit, and Seattle. Um, the Legal Aid Society also would like to encourage the City Council to amend the human rights law to provide protection for all workers and to eliminate entirely the requirement that an employer have four or more employees in order to be covered by the New York City human rights law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Thank you to the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify and to Council Member Rose for championing this legislation. My name is Megan Racklin and I'm a legal fellow at A Better Balance, a national legal nonprofit headquartered in New York City. A Better Balance was founded with the goal of ensuring that all workers have the ability to care for themselves and their families without compromising their economic security. We were proud to support efforts to pass the New York Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, and we were also proud to help draft and shepherd to passage New York City's Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and caregiver discrimination laws. The extension of both of these laws to domestic workers who are so often balancing the work of caring for their employers' families with the need to care for themselves and their own families is urgently needed. We are proud to testify today in support of Intro 339 and the rights of our city's domestic workers. As we noted in our 2007 joint report with the Barnard Center for Research on Women, one of the major problems facing all individuals in the U.S. today is that the labor of caregiving is undervalued. Because caregiving is treated as a private concern, the labor it involves becomes invisible, and caregivers form part of an invisible labor force. Domestic workers who care for their employers' families and homes, in addition to caring for their own families, deserve to work with safety and dignity. Yet behind the closed doors of their employers' homes, domestic workers face higher rates of discrimination and harassment than the average worker. And despite all of this, this workforce, made up of a disproportionate number of women of color and immigrants, has been largely excluded from our nation's anti-discrimination laws. The passage of this legislation extending coverage of New York City's human rights law to domestic workers is an important step towards remedying that disparity. Importantly, this bill would extend to domestic workers the protection of New York City's Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. This legislation will extend crucial protections to some of our city's most vulnerable pregnant workers. For example, Leis M., who recently called our free legal helpline, was employed as a nanny in a family home in New York City. When she became pregnant, her employer asked her what her plans were regarding her pregnancy. Leis told them that she planned to take New York paid family leave and then return to her job, and her employer fired her. Domestic workers like Leis are currently lacking the protection of our city's laws. This legislation would change that. We understand that families who employ domestic workers may worry about how they will manage to comply with these provisions, but fortunately, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act was drafted to provide a workable standard for workers and employers. The strength and effectiveness of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act is that it has led to workers and employers reaching informal resolutions to pregnancy accommodation needs. Additionally, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations for pregnant workers, unless doing so would be an undue hardship for the employer. What constitutes a reasonable accommodation and what circumstances would make provision of an accommodation an undue hardship is a decided on a case-by-case -case basis, allowing for consideration of the realities of life in a domestic worker's workplace, which is to say each family's home. Domestic workers do critical work caring for our children, loved ones, and homes that contributes to the economy and supports millions of American families. They deserve to be able to do that work without sacrificing their personal health and well-being or the ability to care for their own families. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. We are glad to be able to continue this conversation about valuing the work of caregiving and the labor of domestic workers, and we urge you to pass Intro 339. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Casey Wagner, and I want to testify on behalf of uh, Proposed Initiative 339. I want to add my voice to the rich and moving testimony provided by domestic workers, allies, employers, city agencies, and researchers. I will make some brief points from three perspectives. First, as the chair of the Worker Institute's Equity at Work Initiative at Cornell ILR, second in my role as an expert witness in court cases, and third from my perspective as an employer of Maxine, an elder caregiver for my mother, who most certainly makes my work possible, to paraphrase the slogan of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. At Cornell, we have seen through our We Rise Nanny Training Program, which, by the way, is offered in four language to nanny peer educators, English, Spanish, Nepali, and Tibetan, and over the last two years has, graduate, has provided certificates of continuing education to 345 nanny members of all the worker centers who are here on modules uh, including workers' rights and the home as a workplace with particular modules on sexual harassment and our research on workplace harassment. 
that it is critical to create channels through which domestic workers are able to have voice and representation and speak out about the issues affecting them. In addition to uh, that, they need to know they can do safely and with full rights and protections that they will be connected with the appropriate resources and systems of support. Cornell's recently published report entitled Sexual Harassment in the Empire State Poll, uh, in the Empire State, um, past, present, and possible future documents the sheer magnitude of the problem of workplace harassment. The scope of the problem, as captured in our report, suggests this multidisciplinary effort that has been identified today, and we support that effort. Domestic workers are part of industries and occupations that have been characterized by racialized carve-outs from labor and employment protections. And I want to just say that um, Kimberly Crenshaw in her uh, uh, used Anita Hill's testimony to talk about the intersectional perspective of domestic workers uh, around race and, and gender and in other uh, points of identification, it is not possible for women to choose. So the, multiples the multiple identities of domestic workers need to be captured by, this, uh, by the law that is going to be um, promulgated and support the multiple dimensions and protections around um, discrimination. In my 30 years of work in gender justice, which is the foundation for my qualifications as an expert witness in court cases, I've seen the structural inequalities of the law and the workplace exacerbating other societal inequities. This robs workers of basic dignity, dignity rights to a safe work environment and full, protect, full protection of the law afforded to workers. It has been heartbreaking for me to see workers not see justice in their own case, but now there is an opportunity for New York City to make history and lead by example by becoming the second uh, city in the U.S. to provide protections for domestic workers. And Cornell looks forward to leveraging our influence with employers who both employ domestic workers and who uh, larger employers whose employees also employ domestic workers themselves. We will leverage our influence as the School of Industrial and Labor Relations in New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So to all of you advocates and also workers and organizations, on behalf of the great city of New York and also on behalf of all the workers, I thank you very much. And I thank you for uh, your advocacy. I, I thank you for the wonderful job you have been doing on behalf of the hardworking people who make our city strong in a special city. And I believe that all of them, they deserve to be protected. And we have to do everything that we can do to protect their right and their dignity. And uh, doing that we will make New York City a better place for all. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you. With this, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, George. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to see you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you.